Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. Now, uh, you are about to hear an episode that we did with Seamus Keneally uh, from Cannibal Halfling, and um, and and that was that was lovely. Uh, and then I got audio files and found out that Alex's audio file had no data. Uh, he was very much there, but unfortunately, uh, I cannot prove with any uh, audio that he was. So, uh, if you're wondering uh, where Alex was on this particular episode, um, he was just very quiet. However, I do want to play one thing for you right up at the front. Uh, Alex was uh, trying to reconcile his uh, his thing about bears uh, because uh, he has played druids that turn into bears at the same time that he had that run-in where a bear destroyed his car, and he destroyed the bear in turn. Uh, and uh, and we, we had a few things to say about that. So, Alex... This is your moment. This is your Moby Dick moment, but in reverse, where you finally come to peace and decide to use the power of the animal to your own advantage. It's like oh. if Captain Ahab decided to go to war and he brought Moby Dick along with him, and he's like, whale, get him, and just starts going after the enemy ships, plunder them afterward. And then, then there's this magical part where Moby Dick, like, uh, just just like uh, shoots out of the water, and then his fin just hits Ca- Captain Ahab's uh, hand, and they do a high five in midair. The bonding moment, you know. The bonding like, moment. <laughs> freeze frame. Freeze frame. Freeze credits frame. Roll. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and then the, the the '80s pop music comes on. Oh boy. And, then, and it's like the final episode of Saved by the Bell. Moby Dick and Ahab getting together. Oh god. And they then they have that little jump in the air. That that be that is totally how that book should have ended. I gotta go tell Herman Melville. He's still around, right? Alex, you're welcome. And now we move right on to our interview with Seamus Keneally. Uh, a lot of people don't know, but you've actually been on every single episode. We just muted your line. Yeah, I, I always wondered about that. Um, I Sorry. just sort of assumed I was the bass player. Uh, oh yeah, you are. Got lost yeah. in the noise. Um, <laughs> but it's great to theoretically have people hear me finally. Oh, yeah. I I think it's great. You know, we realized that that was like a missed opportunity that we had over the last 120-something episodes. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, we we got around to it. That's always good. Um, (laughs) But uh, but you still got stuff going on. You have had your website for – well, actually, you've had it for longer than Mad Adventures, right? Uh, No, actually. Um, So I joined – Mad Adventures about two years before uh, the Society closed up shop and got turned into an archive. Mm. Um, and when Brian uh, Fiddleback uh, made the announcement, um, I, I remember him basically imploring all of us to keep keep creating. I had never really written online before, before Mad Adventures. I, I'd written with Brian before and like the Gamer Security Agency and stuff like that. But the Mad Adventures was the first time I really did anything like that. When Brian like was like, "Hey, look, you have a readership. You you know you you you've done good work. You, I, I I hope you all keep going." I'm like, "Okay, yeah, you know what? I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna make a website and and run it and write on it. And I have no idea what I'm doing with any of this except maybe something yeah. of writing. But I'm gonna do it anyways. And <laughs> it's been like six, seven months now, and so far." Things have been going decently well. There's still a lot of room for improvement and growth um, with Cannibal Half on Gaming, and I'm 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 learning more every day, practically, because um, I didn't have any idea what I was doing at first. But yeah, it's 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 been going pretty well. Um, we have a we have a modest little following. It's it's nothing big, but you know people wander through. Uh, people get in touch, wanting to get their games reviewed and that sort of thing. And people are, are in touch on Facebook and Google plus and Twitter and the actual website and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's pretty pleasing how it's gone so far. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's uh, cool. Uh, I guess I just felt like it, it feels like you've been around for so long. 
<laughs> that it feels like you've been that you've you, like Mad Adventures was like I, we we got to get around Cannibal Halfling in order to create a thing. <laughs> like you were you were like the mushroom growth on and, and the tree sprung up around it. That's what it felt like to me. Well, I'm I'm, I'm pleased that I've I've made such an imprint. Um, that, that's all retcon now. That's all, that's all retcon. There, there's that word again. Retcon. Uh, retcon. <laughs> One day we will get you a dictionary. I think it's good. And as I look at the Cannibal Halfling website, I realize there's so many other words that we can we can use, like cannibal and halfling <laughs> and affiliate. <laughs> so, so Seamus, the thing that you're pretty well known for are really game reviews. I think that's fair to say. Yeah. So when I decided to create Cannibal Halfling Gaming, um, you know, you need a tagline. And I chose bringing games and gamers together. I still pithy statement. I, I sort of view like the mission statement of Cannibal Halfling to introduce people both to each other and to new games, to things they have in, you know, new games and ideas that they might not have run into before. How long have you been reviewing games, Shannon? Maybe a month or two after I joined the Mad Adventure Society, so about, about two years now? About two so. years. Yeah, something okay. like that. What was the first game that you reviewed? Do you remember? The first game I reviewed, I think they call them micro games, Amidst Endless Quiet. Amidst Endless Quiet. Yeah, it was the first first feature on the independence ever for the Mad Adventures. And it's obviously on Cannibal Halfling now. And uh, why did you want to pick that game? Um, I had run into the game. I went to Gen Con just the once in 2014. And I ran across... Uh, a group called Games on Demand. And what Games on Demand does is that they basically run games. Um, what, there are a bunch of different conventions. There are Gen Con, there are PAX East, PAX West, presumably PAX Tabletop, but we'll see how it happens. They'll have different like hourly or bi-hourly blocks. And uh, a game master will typically have like two games that he or she will want to, will have on offer. And the players who show up for that slot choose which game they want to play. And it mixed Endless Quiet was one of the ones I ended up playing with them. Um, and it was written by one fella. It was like maybe a page or two long. It was very different. It was fun. And that was sort of what got the independence idea started. Let's Let's try to show off something that people haven't seen before that they might not have heard on their own. Right. Did, were you thinking a lot about like independent games in general before that, or were you playing mostly like maybe the, the ones that are coming out from the big game companies? Uh, I suppose up until shortly before then, I'd been mostly playing like the big ones, like D and D was uh, at the time, probably the biggest game I played. Um, but I had started to sort of become aware of smaller publishers. Um, I was working with someone, Brian LeBerge, uh, from Beer Star Games, and he's done some work with Global Press. Um, and she sort of got me started uh, with playtesting things um, and introduced me to Games on Demand. Um, so that's sort of where it got started, where I became aware that it's not just the the typical big games. It's not just the indie and Shadowrun and so on. There's all these other folks uh, making games because we're almost in a. I mean, you know, I'm no I'm no authority to claim this, but we're almost in a, a mm -hmm. role playing game renaissance in, in a way because it's so easy. Big quotes around that word um, right. to make your own game and to get it out there. It it's, obviously takes a lot of work. But with stuff like Kickstarter and you know, Drive Through RPG and the DMs Guild, if you can make it and make it well, then it's going to get out there. And it, it does feel like you know games are definitely like there, there's a lot more to the gaming community than most people who are not in it looking in would realize. Right. Yeah. Especially with independent developers. Yeah. Once you get on the rabbit hole, it's pretty big down there. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a really big rabbit. Uh, that's down that hole. Nasty pointy teeth. It leaps about the whole nine yards. Oh yeah, you need a holy hand grenade for that. And uh, and and from there, you've you've done many. Actually, you uh, you did one that we actually had the uh, creators on the show crush the rebellion as a yes. looking through. That was yes. a fun one. 
That was a yeah, fun yeah. Did you? I, 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 they were, they were super fun when they came on. Uh, I, I like the idea because it kind of flips everything on its, uh, on its head. Yeah. In terms of thought pattern. Yeah, and of um, course they're playing. Well, you're basically playing the bad guys, and you're yeah. out to ruin everyone else's day but your own. Yeah, yeah. You're you're the empire. Yeah, you're, you're the, yeah. You're the evil you're the empire. Evil empire. Yeah, who doesn't like the idea? I'm basically Darth Vader. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm basically Darth Vader's, Vader. Darth Vader's cool. I mean, come on. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Screw you, Skywalker. <laughs> we're gonna go. We're gonna go dark now. Um, so when you're reviewing like independent games, because you you review a lot of them, that's that's you'd say that's the majority of what you do are, are independents. Um, when I'm reviewing games, yes. Um, I I. I can't and honestly say that I review games most. That, that that's most of what I do. But I'm trying to do it more often. Um, right, right. I think I think that's the thing most in line with the whole bringing games and gamers together idea. As in, you know, that helps introduce people to new things. When you uh, review independent titles, um, how do you pick the ones that you're going to talk about? Ooh, I, I wish I could say I had some sort of grand process. I don't. <laughs> Me too. Um, <laughs> that would solve all my problems. It's so very much wandering through the marketplace, almost, and seeing what catches the eye. Um, and one one thing that I, I do with the independence is that if I come across a game that I, I, I don't like, I'm not going to write an article about it. Um, mm. Other folks can can write negative reviews about people. I, I don't personally think that's a good use of my time. I'm going to write about a game that I think people would like. I see. Um, so that, that slows me down a little bit. Not that I've found a huge number of games that are terrible or anything. I haven't, but mm-hmm. if it doesn't, if, if I read a game and it doesn't really catch my eye, then I'm not going to really be able to give it the treatment it deserves, so I don't, I don't, I don't spend the time writing on it. Um, I see. So, I mean, sometimes, you know, how 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 an article gets made for the independence, sometimes it's I find a game at a convention or I end up playing it somehow or uh, someone on Twitter or whatnot uh, points it, you know, towards me. Like just the other day, uh, I wrote about Quill, this this letter writing game of all things. Mm. And uh, <laughs> Leslie from the Mad Adventures, from Swords of the Fifth Age, and now um, Heroes of the Hydean Way, she pointed me towards that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it's sort of a sort of a word of mouth trawling the depths of the marketplace, um, <laughs> F- you know, finding the lost gems. Sort of, yeah. And every once in a while, I'll, I'll uh, a publisher will will get in touch with me first. We'll say, hey, yeah, you know, I see you do reviews. Would you be interested in a copy? I, I almost always answer yes, uh, um, unless unless personal life is going crazy. I'll say, yeah, sure, come on, hand it over. Yeah, here. let me let me see your thing. Yeah, no, no one has handed you the Shia LaBeouf RPG yet, have they? No, and I don't know if that is user friendly content that I would want to feature. Uh, well, that's that that's possible. I hear there's a lot on. of kidney stabbing going on. So it feels like uh, more than than just reviewing games, you want to spotlight games that are worth people's time. Yeah. Now you also did a few articles that were uh, a glimpse into the vault, and those are larger titles. Right. So a glimpse into the vault, um, I did. Four of those, I think. Um, that's actually a, a one I inherited um, from <laughs> David Pickering over at the Mad Adventure Society. Ah, yes. Um, where he wanted to highlight like board games and card games that had maybe been passed by the stream of time. Um, yeah. So I did a couple of those. Those are fun. I'd like to do more of them. Um, I haven't done one since Cannibal Halfling got started. I'd, I'd like to revisit that little series because that, because you know, you stay in this hobby for long enough. Everyone has a giant shelf of board games, and it's very yes. easy for the old one, the old favorite, to vanish under the pile of new stuff. That's true. Yeah, um, it's it's you know it's very fear and loathing in Las Vegas sort of deal. Like once you, you know, you don't really need all those board games once you get started with the collection. Though the instinct is to take it as far as you can. Oh yeah. Um, and, and 
then you just have a bunch on the shelf that you can showcase, but they're still in the plastic because you've never taken them out. <laughs> never played them, right? So exactly. yeah, a, a glimpse into the vault. I, I, I really thought David had a great idea there where it's like, all right, sure, you have the new hotness. But what about this game that came out like five or six years ago that's still really good and still really available? Yeah. So why, yeah, not, why yeah. not give that a little bit of time? Right. Right. Yeah, because I have that symptom, too, just because uh, I've, I've been doing the show long enough that uh, people tell me about games that are cool. And then I go and get those games. But then I realize I have no one to play with anyway. Yep. So they just sit in in the <laughs> they sit in the wrapper on my shelf and I never get around to them. And that's they're waiting. A, they're waiting for their time to shine. They're they're waiting for their time to shine, and I realize that everybody that I currently live with uh, gets like confused by Monopoly, so I'm really in tough shape. Yeah, it's a hard that's a hard sell. It's it's a hard sell because I have a copy of Vast. I'd love to try and figure out how to play Vast, but I know that I am not going to have anybody around to play with. <laughs> right. But besides that, you do a few other things at uh, at Cannibal Halfling. Can you tell me a few of the other projects that you have going yeah, on? Yeah, so the other two uh, series that I do are uh, Meet the Party and Adventure Log. And Meet the Party got its start when I was with uh, Fiddleback at the Gaming Security Agency. Gamer Security Agency? I can't quite remember which one it is. Um, <laughs> doesn't exist anymore is the point. But they, <laughs> they had a series called Heroes on Demand. Um, which created a, a character for a role-playing game that you could then take and play in your own game or at least use it to inspire it. And when I got in touch with Fiddleback to join the Mad Adventure Society, I proposed, hey, why don't we bring back the Heroes on Demand idea? And he said, no, do a whole party instead. Mm. Uh, I was like, oh, huh, hadn't thought of that. Okay, let's do that. So what Meet the Party is, is I build a, well, usually I build a full party of characters uh, that you can basically take off the page, put on a character sheet, and just hit, you know, hit the ground running. Um, and I try to do it for a bunch of different systems. I've done D&D 5th Edition. I've done all of the Star Wars Fantasy Flight games. I've done Dark Heresy, Iron Kingdoms, uh, a number of the games featured in the independents have then gotten the meet the party treatment. Um, gotcha. Like, uh, let's see. Uh, I have one coming up for Doe, Fate of the Flying Temple. I did the Mistborn adventure game, that sort of thing. Um, mm. And uh, one, I love building characters, so it's just sort of a fun diversion, anyways. Because um, I don't just I build the characters, and then I also provide usually um, provide like a little bit of backstory and a little bit of the relationships in the party so that you can, you know, they're, so they're like a full starter character to be able to play with. Oh, um, nice. Nice. And then the adventure log, um, was a, a later edition while I was at the Mad Adventure Society and it's continued on to Cannibal Halfling where it's basically a, a, a play report of an actual game. Um, I write about what happened in, game and then the latter half of the article is I try to pull a lesson I've learned as a GM or as a player from that session and talk about that um, and there's been a sort of uh, the, the sort of ongoing series is called Living on Borrowed Time and it's a Star Wars Age of Rebellion game uh, but I've sort of I've had a few one-offs um, I did uh Adventure Log D and D for beginners um, because I, I ran a couple pickup games uh, for a board game night. That was really fun, and I recently had one for a Dark Heresy game um, that appropriately enough talked about uh, player characters dying willingly. Is it like what? What is the main thing that you've learned from? Like since we're talking about Adventure Log, what is the main thing that you've learned from from GMing games? Oh boy, let's see. That is a whole. Nest of purple worms. Um, <laughs> right up there with the drop owl bears. Uh, oh yeah, scary, scary stuff. So if I had to pick one thing, what would it be? Your favorite uh, child. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is your favorite child? Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, I'm going to sort of go with a little. It's, it's a common enough response. I said, communication is the big thing, and that's important for a GM, but it's also important for players. You need to talk to other people. It's it's a social activity 
Um, and if you're not actually talking to the people across from the table, you're, you're not you're not going to have a good time. Um, right. It's it's very easy if you don't have a communicative group or if a problem develops that it becomes much more than a problem and the group falls mm-hmm. apart. Um, you have to be willing to, as you know, as the GM, you have to be willing to ask your players, hey, you know, are, are you guys having a good time? Is there anything you're not liking about where the game has been going? Is there anything you want to see uh, on the other side of the screen as a player? You have to be willing to speak up and tell the GM, uh, you know, I'm not really comfortable with this, or I would like to try this instead, or, hey, I've got this really cool idea for a character. Uh see if we can you know work it into the game that sort of thing um i've had much more success across oh god a decade and a half of playing role-playing games when i talked to people actually mm-hmm. talked to people than yeah. just keeping my nose down behind the screen and assuming that everything is going okay <laughs> when it was I not when it was not and then the next thing you know the entire party is dead and you don't know why. <laughs> and if you're, the, if you're the GM, the party is dead and you can't, you don't know why everyone is dead. You have made some mistakes. <laughs> okay. The, the, the TPK has caught up to you. Oh, well, I guess that was a lesson. We right. learned. Yeah. Somewhere. Like, huh? The pod. Okay. What's, what's going on here? Why, why, why did this ha- Why did the wizard drop a fireball on the fighter in the rogue? <laughs> what, what was the what was the motivation behind that? Okay. Uh, somehow we could have seen the warning signs. <laughs> there should have been signs, right? Yeah, there exactly. Zaldar the Magnificent was such a quiet man. He lived <laughs> alone. <laughs> if only we knew. Oh, if only he seemed knew. so nice. Seems he seemed so nice. So- he seemed so nice. And then he killed this whole party. We don't uh-huh. know what happened. And he kept to himself. So much but, fire. So much fire. So basically, uh, you know, the, the game characters need a little bit of therapy involved. And sometimes so do the players, yeah. So do the players, exactly. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's good advice for anyone who's thinking of starting a role-playing game. You have to be mentally prepared to talk to people. Right, and it sounds so simple, right? Oh, yeah, of course I'm playing yeah. a role. Of course I'm talking to people. All right, but when Ex- you have a concern, yeah, talking, yeah, I was talking at and there's talking with. And curiously right. enough, that's right. also, you know, it's, it's also been very helpful. That lesson's been very helpful in running a gaming website. Because like I said earlier, <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. None. Right. And uh, yet, and, you know, it, half, you know, half of my what I consider to be my actually good article ideas have come from talking with people online on Twitter and whatnot. And or, you know, when I've had trouble, I've, you know, in the early days, I went to fiddle back and like, all right, I have no idea what I'm doing. How do I how do I do this whole WordPress website thing? What what what? Why? <laughs> uh, he was very helpful, of course. And then. I was very lucky to have someone join me in writing for Cannibal Halfling Gaming, and that's been huge. Um, Aaron Aaron Marks has been writing with me almost since the beginning, and he's been great. Um, he's he's one of my longtime GMs. He's one of my longtime players, and now now he's a, my, my partner basically in this whole crazy writing project. So it, that's been it's been great to have someone on side basically. <laughs> Yeah, so it's always good to have somebody else around. I mean, that's why yeah. I keep Alex. Yeah, right. <laughs> We're a little less belligerent with one another, but that's because we play paranoia with one another now and again. So that sort of works out any tension that we might have. Oh, um, <laughs> okay. With the laser pistols and the suddenly exploding everything. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> that's what, that, that's always fun. Yeah, yeah they. They decide that uh, we lost our license to have laser pistols for that very reason. Well, yeah, that, that we use them inappropriately. Yeah. Um, the thing that I, I, I do realize is the thing that you have the most articles for really is meet the party. Oh, yeah, I got yeah. I got started 53? on that. Early. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and I keep thinking to myself, just just because I'm not as familiar with all of this. Have you noticed that it's really difficult for people to come up with like a, a party for for a role playing game? I've noticed that it it obviously depends on the system. 
this, particularly for a new player and particularly for the more number crunchy sorts of games. Yeah, it can be really difficult. There's like three chapters devoted to making a character. It's like 100 pages. Where do I even start with all this? What are dice? Like, what's going on? Um, so part of it is part of why I started Meet the Party was to sort of offer up that service. Like, oh, so you've heard about this game. Dungeons Dragons is an example. You have no idea where to get started. Here's a character you can take and, you know, and, and jump right. on it. Um, right. And the other thing is sort of, uh, like I don't really expect very many Meet the Party characters to actually end up on a table. I think what happens with most of them is hopefully people see them and they get an idea of mm-hmm. a character they maybe haven't played before. And like, oh, huh, all right, maybe I want to try something like that. Sort of right. like, sort of an inspirational tool as much as of a pr- uh, practical one. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, because I mean, I I kind of feel like uh, some people want to just have an entire party of just mages. Can we just oh. have like all mages? I think I had a meet uh, <laughs> a meet the party recently that was all fifth edition sorcerers. <laughs> And it, it worked surprisingly. It I, I based it off of one of the Unearthed Arcana articles that Wizards has put out recently, and uh, it worked surprisingly well. Wizards of the Coast has been doing this Unearthed Arcana thing where they release basically playtesting material. Um, and that's one of the, the things that Meet the Party has done comparatively recently, is take this playtesting material and make characters with it so that people can use them to playtest the stuff with. Um... And I know for a fact that oh, maybe it was the Warlock one. But yeah, sure enough, there's a, a, a sorcerer who has Divine Blood who has a bunch of healing abilities that they came up with. So there's all sorts of weird stuff that uh, that, that Wizards is, has made. And they're they're publishing that new book in a couple months. Uh, they, they basically, I can eventually find a wizard that will replace every other character class. You could probably find a wizard that could place every class because they're wizards. Yeah. Then again, you could See? also find a fighter who uses magic. So I don't know, man. It's all over the place. It is all over the place. I can just be whatever I want. So that's the, the, so, the joy of role playing games. <laughs> that is the joy of role playing games. So see, suck it, Alex. I was right. You were wrong. Uh, I didn't mean that's to do that, me. Alex. I'm sorry. No. I, and no, it is no. It needed to happen. I didn't it mean to enable it. To hap- needed to happen eventually. I want to be a warlock healer fighter, and you can't stop me. I I had the thought the other day of wait a minute, how many characters have I made in the past? And I tried not to think about it because, oh, like you said, there's yeah. there's 53 articles. Some of them only have one or two characters because they're a special special edition or whatever, but most of them have at least four. Some have five. So I, I oh god, Seamus. I mean, there's there's a lot that we can talk about with the website, but you actually work on other things besides that. Yes, yes, I do. Um, I've done a couple little projects over the years, and and right now the biggest one is is transit. That is definitely a thing that is still going on. Thank goodness. <laughs> I, I, it's funny because occasionally I hear people kind of go, yep, we're working on something with transit and I'll be kind of like going, oh, wow, they're, they're every, like, it's consistent. Like every week or so I hear somebody say something about yep. transit and I'm like, wow, they are really hitting this. We're just plugging along, plugging they're along plugging beneath the surface. Um, plugging it on. Uh, for folks that don't know what Transit is, can you give uh, basically the, the rough outline of what Transit RPG is? Sure, I can give the I can give the rough outline. I am by no means the authority. I am one third of the authority. But <laughs> um, so Transit RPG is a uh, RPG that is currently uh, transitioning from its alpha version to its beta version. That's what we're working on right now. Mm-hmm. And it is a role playing game that is powered by the apocalypse. It uses the same roughly speaking, gaming system as Apocalypse World, uh, Night Witches, Mashed, Dungeon World, all those games. Um, And the basic conceit is that you, the player characters, are playing artificial intelligences who are installed in a variety of different spaceships um, because it takes an artificial intelligence to calculate the transits 
across interstellar distances and you are for one reason or another exploring the frontier of known space and trying to push that boundary ever ever farther and farther out that's what people do and people tell ais what to do and then the ais have to do those things even though the organic crews are all crazy or don't want to fly through the wormhole into unknown space with horrible gibbering monsters or <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a hard life out there for an ai in the transit universe you have a lot of problems <laughs> so like the, the the theme of one of the theme of the games is you know you're 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 an explorer one way or another um but we're also hoping to sort of drive home the point that you're you're playing an artificial intelligence you're not playing a human or any other sort of organic creature and you're sort of caught between a lot of different obligations you need to complete your mission but you also have this organic crew maintaining your ship that you need to keep relatively pleased or also or else they're going to start doing stupid stuff um Mm -hmm. and then well, ostensibly, I mean, it does cost resources to recruit more crew, so you do sort of want to keep them alive. Um, I think you might have your own goals. It might not really line up with what Mission Control wants you to be doing. So, right, um, it's it's not like Apocalypse World in that you're not really living in a world of scarce resources. You're you're, you're an artificial intelligence inside a giant spaceship. But mm-hmm. you are still living in a universe where there's just a lot going on and you have a limited amount of, of, of processing power to devote mm-hmm. to thing. You have to choose uh, what you're going to focus on. Yeah. I don't know if the crew is really all that necessary because of it, I, I keep thinking to myself, well, if I'm the AI and I'm kind of running the show, what's the crew there for? See, I think that without the crew, this would have made the AI's job way easier. They that is, that is, that is in fact the point. <laughs> exactly. That is the point. The crew are not there to make your life easier. I also think that if I were the AI, I would be uh, looking for like robot labor rights and see if I could get them to replace my crew. I, th- I, th- I think I should replace my crew with robots and then I don't have to deal with like the crew's stuff because it feels like they have a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they could be helpful, too. They're not at all bad. Squishy. Eh, bags. Silly meat bags. Know. Yeah. Silly meat bags. And then I have to have food services and then I need refrigeration for food services. They want they want a craft service bar. They are just impossible. I, I feel like I feel like this is kind of like the role playing game I was made to play where I can just be a robot. <laughs> Basically, I can just be an artificial intelligence because that's pretty much what I am already. But I, I am kind of interested in like what kind of brain it would have. Would it be like in like Ex Machina where you have like the gel like brain synapse thing or would it be like a motherboard Sort of up to the group, we're sort of still in the stage where we're writing like the setting as well. Mm. Um, but a lot of a lot of details like that, I think, are going to be up to up to the you know the GM and the players, the individual groups. Yeah, um, yeah. We're, we're we're writing. It's really Fiddleback who's writing most of the setting stuff, and me and Bradford are, are sort of chiming in. But the setting as it stands is sort of background. Um, right. It exists for a group to build off of, but all the minutia, if you will, <laughs> um, is is hopefully uh, going to be created at the table, you know, uh, between yeah. the players and the GM. I so get maybe, you. Maybe everyone is some sort of giant silicon brain. Maybe it's a motherboard. Maybe there's holograms for days. Who knows? Oh, it would be so great to be the Borg. Oh, oh boy. We showed off the alpha through the Mad Adventures, and what's happening right now is that Fiddleback, uh, Brad, and myself, we've each taken the alpha, and we're individually editing it and turning it into a beta version, and we're going to compare all three versions to sort of see what what works and sort of meld them together. Um, so there's a fair amount of minutia that's already done, but there's a lot of, a lot of little things that still need to be done that we're working on at the moment. Uh, well, that, that's really interesting. Um, I don't see a lot of role-playing games where I get to play an artificial intelligence. 
Yeah, I mean that was sort of that was sort of uh, Fiddleback's idea um, when he proposed it to us. Basically, yeah. said, hey, who wants to help me design a game? And me and Bradford were like, uh, us, I guess. Okay, sure. What's it about? AI. Okay. <laughs> Tag. Tag. You're it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you get your ship destroyed, there is a chance that you survive. There's a chance you get downloaded into a new ship first. However, if the download doesn't go really well, uh, there are some problems, which quickly develop. There's a list of, of increasingly horrifying personality flaws that you can develop as a result of this emergency download going awry. That's one of the things that we're adding minutia to right now, but there's already a, a fair, fair number of them. I'm guessing that maybe that's why I wanted to keep my crew alive, so that when the ship gets destroyed, I, there's, there's not as many problems with the download... Yeah, that might be part of it. Well, I guess if it's to protect my own personality, it's worth trying to keep some meatbags alive a little longer. Yeah, the meatbags also have this alarming tendency to build self-destruct buttons into things. See, I never understood that. Why yeah. Why would you even bother? I don't know why they do that. They just Seems like a redundant system. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, like maybe uh, there could be a race of like sentient bulls. And there, uh, there's like a giant uh, red panel on the back of the ship, and they keep trying to bust into it, but it's the self-destruct button. They just made an entire wall a self-destruct button. There are some very strange things in space. There are some very strange things in space. And, and who doesn't want to see giant sentient bulls? Basically minotaurs. There should be a heart of the TARDIS in the ship, and then you wouldn't need a crew anymore. Maybe that's how the could, transit. Maybe that's how the transit system works. Yeah, I'm and, not an AI. Yeah, absolutely. And the TARDIS technically can drive itself. Oh, Fiddleback is going to yell at me over this. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean you told everyone that the transit is a TARDIS? I have this. I have this. I have this terrifying idea where there's like a mini RPG where you're playing the crew of a transit ship but i'm pretty sure you just end up playing paranoia so so transit's going good <laughs> it is it is it really is what um, we're getting at we're hoping we're hoping to have the beta fully online very soon once we slurp all of the, the different versions back together ah wow. slurping and then yes. uh exactly what the future holds i'm not entirely sure we're just sort of taking it one one part of the project at a time Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's it's a it's a long, slow process most of the time. Yeah, but it's right. it's rewarding at the end. It's very rewarding during as well. It's it's been a lot of fun. Do you have any games that are coming up that you're excited to review? Uh well, I just got uh, a book from uh, called uh, Synthesize. Um, from... I've heard of this. Yes. Yes, yes. You, uh, you guys actually sent me this one. Sent it uh, my way. Um, so there's that. Uh, let's see. I'm hoping I'm talking to some folks from uh, Magpie Games at the moment as well about uh, reviewing Masks, um, which is another like transit uh, powered by the Apocalypse game. It's all about like teenage superheroes, that sort of thing. Um, that's a really nice book to look at too so just just reading that thing is a, is a, is a delight um cool. so those two are the two uh things on the docket for the independence right now aaron is what is he up to i think the next thing he's doing is system split another system split article and he what he does with system split is he takes a a system and a genre and he'll compare two different games in it. So, like, the first one he did, he took, uh, what, what's the recent one he did? He took Eclipse Phase, and you could play Eclipse Phase as either a Fate-powered game, or its original D100 version, and I think he is doing Paranoia next. Actually, Paranoia is coming up a lot today. I wonder why. He's doing the old version of Paranoia and the new, the new card-based one for his next System Split article, I think. So, so basically, thematically the same, but you're playing in two very different ways. Yeah, yeah, the system is very different. So, sort of like he took a look at cyberpunk games inside of Apocalypse World. He, compla- he compared the sprawl and the veil. Um, bef- after that, he compared uh, Monster Hearts and uh, Urban Shadows for like two horror-based games. So. Mm-hmm. 
that 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 little mini series is doing that's that's hit it off really well with people. People love that one. Well, because it does feel like there are a lot of uh, <clears throat> a lot of games that kind of uh, switch up what they do with the system, but they use the same basic idea for the game. Right. Yeah. Sort of like the high concept is the same. So what's right. un- what's under the hood? Like yeah. What are, what's what are the differences going to be? And that's what Aaron gets into with systems. Play. Right. Right, right, right. Because there, there can be different ways to play essentially the same game. They did that with like Pandemic, because right, they had yeah. the cure. Yeah, and they did yeah. that. Uh, yeah, and then uh, just because I see uh, shelves at Walmart and other places all over the place, is uh, basically Hasbro and I think uh, Parker Brothers just started doing like all sorts of Go versions, like card based versions of their games. Oh yeah, <laughs> like Monopoly. Sorry, all those. Uh-huh. And, and maybe maybe to make Monopoly uh, more tolerable for people like Alex, I don't really know, but ah, Monopoly is not tolerable for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> are there are there any games that you reviewed uh, from the independents that you come back to uh, from the time you reviewed them? Play them again? Um, hmm. Play them again? Yes. Review them? Not quite yet. I don't think. A couple I've come back to in terms of writing because I've been featured them on like Meet the Party or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. uh, like, okay, I've showed this game off to you, but now I'm going to show you what an actual character looks like if you're curious. Help, right. you know, help, help, help someone who sees an Independence article and is like interested but doesn't know where, really where to start get going. Mm-hmm. Um, but so far, none of them have really had a different. Um, like a new edition or anything like that. Uh, the only real candidates at the moment would be, well, Paranoia again, because um, new edition, I feature them, and maybe Interface Zero, which since I uh, wrote about it, has come out with, uh, like a, a it, it's originally a Savage Worlds game, and now it has like a Fate, game, Fate version, and it just released a Pathfinder version of the game. Um, oh, wow. So there could be, there could be a, a return to that, or we could end up being another. You know, Aaron could grab it and go system split on it. But generally speaking, aside from visiting a system with Meet the Party, I haven't. They haven't come back around again, really. Something to think about, though, just because uh, sometimes I I see something that I liked, mm-hmm. mostly just because uh, mostly for me it's it's video games. And uh, I'll play something, and then you put it down for a while, and three years later you come back to it and kind of go, "Oh, I remember that. I remember I like that. Yeah, no. <laughs> Did I, I like that, or didn't I like that?" <laughs> Every oh, once in a while, I'll I'll, I'll trawl through the archive and see, "Hey, you know, what haven't I what haven't I thought about in a while?" Sort of refresh my memory. Right, because there are there are those that uh, I will I will pick up. I'll play through to completion, and then I will never, never, never pick it up again. Mm-hmm. And then there are those that you start in on, and you're like, yeah, all right. And then, and then three years later, you finish it. Yeah. And yeah. Then you never you never got around to it before. You're like, why did I finish this back in the day? This is awesome. Yeah, yeah. I must have had something else going on. Yeah, I we never, can never remember what that something else was. I never remember what that something else was. I have a feeling it probably had something to do with Fallout. There's that cannibalhalflinggaming.com, correct? Correct. Um, you can also find us on Twitter at Hungry Halfling. Um, I'm on Twitter personally at RGM79Ace, and you can find my fellow cannibal halfling, uh, Aaron Marks, uh, at Level 1 Wonk. At Level 1 Wonk. Yeah, uh, that's the series that he seems to do most prominently on the show. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's his... Uh, sort of a grab bag series a little bit of reviews a little bit of a uh, little bit of mechanics questions a little bit of uh story ideas he does all sorts of stuff he's good at it. all sorts all sorts of good stuff absolutely yeah. and actually seamus while we're at it uh you were mentioning that hashtag uh transit rpg if people were looking for more information about uh about the game Yes, if you basically want to uh, keep track of uh, where we are in our development process and uh, talk to us about it, that is the hashtag to follow. Perfect. And then you can keep up on your uh, artificial AIs that may or may not be homicidal. Really want to keep up with them. Yeah, you want to. Eyes on all the time. Eyes on. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, you got to keep eyes on Skynet or you never know. 
they might uh, they might do something bad one day. They invented cloud computing, you know. Also, of course, our boilerplate that uh, you can uh, find more information about the show and all the stuff that uh, Alex and I do over at DelveCast.com. Uh, you can also find us on iTunes, Google Play, pretty much every single place where you can listen to podcasts, you can listen to Delve. And uh, we will have links at the bottom of the show description on Delvecast. You can also find us on Twitter. I am at Citanium, Alex is at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. Anyway, I want to thank Seamus uh, for coming on the show. Uh, or actually, I should say, uh, for coming on the show for like the 120-somethingth time, uh, but actually being heard this time. It's great. It's it's a new experience, and I'm, I'm really uh, happy about it. Um, yeah, yeah. No doubt, for the next... 119 episodes i will be muted again you probably um, will. but i'll see you on episode 240 that sounds about right that sounds about right i mean it was a fun little experiment i don't know uh, how often we're going to do it but you know I, I think it i think it worked out pretty well this time okay yeah. <laughs> and, good glad to yeah, help it, it had to help you know it was it was a weird experiment we didn't think uh this whole time yeah maybe we should just let uh Seamus talk but you know yeah, yeah live and learn and get lost. Anyway, uh, so for all of us uh, here at Delve uh, and all of our orky goodness, uh, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. They're in the World Wide Web. I, I, I get that. I get that. And their tweets are literally sent out by birds. <laughs> right? This all sounds legitimate to me. This sounds, it sounds perfectly right. In fact, I'm thinking that the internet was really just based around this concept. <laughs> the entire internet was pretty much based. That one got really, really high. <laughs> That's pretty much. Spirit quest-like <laughs> visions. Yeah. And then opened up a computer and got to work. But, but really, <laughs> you know, the thing about it is, really every great technological advance started with somebody probably got really fucking high. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fair. It's fair. Think about it. No, oh, but yeah. it's 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 like the 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 Monty Python school of castle building, right? <laughs> okay, you dream a campaign and it burns down to the ground, and then you build another campaign on top of it and it burns down to the ground, <laughs> and you build a third one, and at this point it's so high up on all the ash from all the other actually flammable things, yeah, that it stays up. <laughs> and then you're fine. You're fine. Then you're, that, fine. you're fine. Yeah. Everything's okay now. Yeah. There's a coal bot. No, there's no coal bot. There's no budget I call for that. Coley. There's no there's no budget for coal bots in transit, I'm afraid. Colin Shovel. That's what his name is. <laughs> he shovels coal into the intergalactic thing. Why are we still on coal in space? There were some mistakes. The good, the good news is, is that we don't make the player characters think about what's fueling the ships. <laughs> well, see, there there you go. See, we there were just go. trying to make something out of nothing there, Alex. 